Hi, I'm Scott Slater. I'm service canon to the Ordinary at the Diocese of Maryland, and this is a brief overview of our upcoming diocesan convention. On the following video, you will be able to find out how to access our pre-convention journal online, which we encourage you to do first. Also, we will review the agenda for the two days, especially the start and end times. We will introduce nominees for elected offices. We will go over briefly our procedures, especially microphone procedures for those who wish to speak from the floor. Finally, we will go over the resolutions that are being presented. We look forward to seeing you soon. But before we proceed, please go to our website to download the pre-convention journal so you can refer to it during this video. Please go to www.episcopalmaryland.org. Click on the What's New tab on the right on the left side of the page. Click on Convention, and there you'll see a link to the journal. Also, just as a matter of disclosure, we are videotaping this for those who cannot be here or who want to choose to look at it later online, so be wary of what you say that could be captured by the camera. I'm saying that to myself more than anything. Welcome everyone, my name is Scott Slater. I serve as canon to the ordinary here on the diocesan staff and one of my responsibilities in that role is to be the staff coordinator of our diocesan conventions. So I've had a great deal of help from a wonderful planning team as well. Just to give you an overview before we open with prayer, we're going to go over the agenda of conventions, particularly so that you know when we are starting and ending. Are you recording now, by the way? We're going to then go over the nominations for offices and talk a little just briefly about that process, especially this year, and introduce anyone, who, any of the nominees for elected office who are here tonight and give them a chance to say a few words. We will briefly go over procedural guidelines, especially giving reminders of microphone procedures. We're going to talk about all six resolutions, giving any of you who are submitters a chance to talk about those up at the mic as well and to offer any, any of the rest of you any comments or questions you might have. And we're in the midst of that going to talk particularly about how we're going to deal with resolutions this year procedurally that are different than we've done in the past. So I hope I have your intrigue so that you pay attention and fall asleep between now and then, and especially for those of you watching at home. <laughs> Lastly, we will briefly talk about general convention coming up, and a few uh, of us who are deputies are here just to give you some highlights of what we're anticipating as far as legislation. And then a few minutes, two to three, from Charles Cloen. We were negotiating that earlier uh, to talk about Bishop's Appeal. And he has some material to send home with you if, uh, if you're here so that we can avoid having to either get it to you at convention or mail it to you later. It's a matter of being good stewards. For a moment, please raise your hand if you're a first-time deputy or alternate to convention. And you've never come to a diocesan convention before. Okay. Um, if any of you would like to stay behind when we're all done for a brief tutorial, I'm glad to do that, rather than hold everyone else hostage to go over that kind of stuff. We can even practice microphone procedure, if you wish. But let's begin with the prayer. I'd like to invite you to remain seated if you wish, unless you really want to kneel or stand, but uh, I'm going to stay standing, but you are welcome to stay seated. The Lord be with you. The Lord also be with you. Let us pray. Most holy, most gracious, most merciful, most loving God, as we gather in the midst of our city and strife, we ask for your continued presence, not just among us tonight, but in, in the areas and neighborhoods that are in distress, that as peaceful protests continue, we ask that they override other actions that are less than peaceful. Help us to all be good stewards of the ways that you help us to live out our baptismal ministries as we gather together in the role of deputies and delegates to our convention, remind us ever to be representatives of our congregations and representatives of our own morality and integrity. This we pray in your name. Amen. 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 
So, if you did not have a chance to pick up the orange pre-convention journal, you can still pick one up at the back if you want to take one home to a delegate or a clergy person who is not here tonight. You're welcome to take more than one. We just ask you to only take one per person. And we're going to trust you to do that because in the past we used to make you sign out. But we're trying to be more trusting this time. Uh, uh, couched a little bit laziness by admission. Also, you're more than welcome to download it from our website. If you actually download it rather than just view it from our website, you will, you will see there are tabs marked for locating the various parts of the convention journal that we'll be talking about. So I want to call your attention first to page 5, the agenda. I just want to highlight a couple of things to be aware of that are both important as far as starting times and that are going to be different this year than in years past. We will begin at 10 a.m. Friday morning with the Convention Eucharist. That is what we did last year. That seemed to work well to begin an hour later than we normally do because that allows more commuter time and flexibility for people who are having to travel the Beltway and other roads that are less than predictable on a Friday morning. We will do our typical opening business session right after that, go to lunch, gather back and conduct business up until 4.30 p.m., after which we will break for one of four workshops that will conclude our day. The titles of those workshops are listed below. We will talk a little bit more about those uh, descriptively once we get to convention. And then those four workshops will again be repeated on Saturday after lunch, the exact same workshop. So the idea is that if uh, typically, any congregation is represented by at least two people, the lay delegate and the cleric. Some, obviously, some parishes have more than that, but at least allows each of you to, for one congregation's representation to attend all four workshops once, if you divide it up. So just be thinking about with your other um, delegates how you might want to divide yourselves up in order to take advantage of those workshops. We're going to conclude for the day at 6 o'clock, and it is important that we clear out because there's a prom happening that night. <laughs> well, okay. When we asked about how much extra would it be to rent out the space for prom so that we didn't have to kind of make the switch over, it was an additional $10,000, which is about seven times what we're paying for the two full days. So that was an easy decision to make. And it's a, it's a hospitality effort as well. For so I have a son who's going to prom twice this season. So we'll flip to the next page, page six. We begin on Saturday morning at nine o'clock because we do not have commuter traffic to contend with, hopefully. And we also do not have a sheep and wool festival to compete with this year like we did last year. That's part of why we're meeting a week later. These are important details once you kind of experience them. So... You can do the sheep, wolf, sheep and wolf festival the, the previous weekend and then do this the next weekend if you wish. We will conclude our business before lunch at 1230 and then again go into workshops at 2 o'clock which will run until 315 and then we will, we will be done. Now that's the general time frame of beginning and ending times. What I want to call your attention, your attention to for a moment is the business session on page 5, starting at 3 p.m. You'll notice it says, Report of the Resolutions Committee and Resolution Discussion. The word discussion is very intentional because it is not the word debate. <laughs> debate will happen on Saturday, not presumably on Friday. Because debate involves taking a stand and voting. We intentionally do not want to do that on Friday so that we actually discuss the resolutions rather than debate them. And there's a nuance there. We feel that if we can discuss the res resolutions first at small tables where we'll be gathered and then perhaps gathering comments and questions from those tables and then allowing everyone to sleep on it and think about and pray about the resolutions based on the discussion on Friday and giving the writers the feedback information from you all on Friday so that they can perhaps craft, if they wish, some friendly amendments for the next day. When we do debate them, then it will make our time more fruitful, both on Friday and on Saturday. The intent of the planning committee was to avoid what is now infamously known as 
the no meat resolution of last year. <laughs> Director <laughs> championed that cause on behalf of one of his clergy, uh, one of his laity, one of his parishioners. So, for any of you that were there last year, you will remember, and full disclaimer, this is just my own um, biased opinion and perspective on this, we spent about an hour arguing over wordsmithing rather than discussing a resolution. There were some discussion points within that, but the focus was more on wordsmithing than it was on the meat, the meat, the meat behind the resolution. It's not the first time I said that. So we're hoping to actually engage in some discussion that is meaningful, thoughtful, and provocative on Friday so that when we begin debating those, the debate will be more efficient and more thoughtful and more productive. So we're going to try it this year. If it works great, we'll probably do it again next year. We might learn some things and adapt it the following year, but we want to try it. And so far, we've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. So we'll see how it goes. Any questions about the resolution? Oh, oh, something I failed to mention. At your small tables, and, and we're not doing assigned seating, so you'll presumably be sitting with people from your own congregation, but there's a good chance you'll have other people from another congregation with you, so you will have a chance to hear some other perspective. But you will be given the opportunity to write down questions and comments about each resolution on postcards that will be at each table that will be color-coordinated and titled as per the resolutions. So we're, we're getting as high-tech here as we can without actually doing away with paper in this case. So for instance, there will be one colored postcard with the title fracking on the top, which is a kind of a shorthand for one of the resolutions on hydraulic fracturing. So if you have comments or questions related to that, you'll put them on those cards. Those will be collected and given to the submitters to work on in the night, if they wish. There will be one card just on two of the resolutions which involve the regional council structure because those two resolutions go together. And so it's easy to use one card for those. And there will be one blank card for any miscellaneous questions that are related to anything else that comes up. So for one thing, we're not doing a separate card for the compensation and benefits resolution, which is first, because typically that doesn't elicit a lot of comments or questions but there's still a blank card that you can use if you want to for that, okay? So we'll, 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 that will make a little more sense once we talk about those resolutions. So let's move next on to page 26 for nominations for offices. The majority of our nominees for offices are running unopposed this year. So we're anticipating a single ballot to elect. And I'll explain what that means. Last year, again, if you're, if you're a delegate, you'll remember that we were electing general convention deputies, ECW triennial de uh, delegates, and a bishop suffragans. So there were a lot more people to elect and a lot more ballots than it took to get to that spot. And a lot less people to elect this year. And Anyone who is running unopposed will be, elect, presumably, if we agree to the procedural um, guidelines, will be elected by a ballot cast unanimously on our behalf by the Secretary of Convention. And that will be a procedural question that you will all be asked at the beginning. Right now, that is likely to happen for almost all of the elected positions unless someone is nominated from the floor. And if, if I were to prognosticate, I would say that's unlikely to happen. But it can. There's, a, there's an ability to do that. So we're just going to go through each um, individual here. And if they are present, I'm going to invite you to come forward and introduce yourself and say anything briefly that you wish to say that isn't already covered in the written description. It's David Anthony Huggins here. I think so. Is Jim Perry here? I didn't think so. So again, presumably to use them as an example, unless someone's not in the floor, they will be elected because they are running out of post. Next page on 28, Diocese and Council of Large Lay Nominees. This is a situation where we will presumably elect all three of these individuals, but we still have to vote on them because they are filling two elected terms and one unexpired term for a 
current diocesan council member who had to move uh, to Chicago this year and not fulfill his term. So what that means is we will cast two votes for these three individuals, and the person with the least amount of votes will be given the shorter unexpired term. Does that make sense? And we will explain that again before you cast your votes. And I don't see any of them here. You, you, you all from Redeemer would know whether Judy were here or not. I don't see Carrie. Okay, I don't see Kathy. Uh, we will elect one of the two on the next page, page 30, for Dossus and Council of Large in the Clerical Order. And I do not see either Travis or Ramel here either. So, let's keep going. Page 31, we have two lay people running for the two lay slots on disciplinary board, running in a proposed, essentially, and one cleric running for the one position. And I don't see Mechie here, I don't see Pete here, and I don't see Joanna here. Oh, you're here. And that's you, you're being so quiet. <laughs> and that's you, if I can invite you up, please, for just a moment. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, those glasses are working. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad another person. Hi. Hi. I'm Inechi Modu. I have a little blurb in there. Um, I'm not sure what else to add, although I hear um, these um, disciplinary matters, I think, are. Um, much beyond what I do now. I'm an administrative judge for the EEOC, so I hear employment discrimination cases, all civil rights, civil stuff. Um, and so I figure since I'm used to hearing cases with evidence and the like, that this might fit. And perhaps I could use my skills to the benefit of the diocese. So that's why I'm running. Without wanting to sound biased, if you look through the descriptions of some of the other folks that are already on the, the group, we, we are very blessed to have some highly skilled people as part of the disciplinary board process. Okay, standing committee, the nominees begin on page 34. And we do have two of our representatives for the lay order here, so I'm going to invite you all to come up in alphabetical order. So Mary... obviously in the booklet, uh, I call myself today a green volunteer. I keep being recycled. And so I was very active here in the diocese and chaired uh, the uh, budget and program committee and did other, lots of other things because when you chair that, all of a sudden you're on five additional committees and six subcommittees, you know, the usual. But I am, um, I had felt a call to come back as a senior warden at my church. Uh, during a time of transition, because that's where my skills, I think, come into play in my life outside the church. But I also felt a call to do this, and I think it has some of the same values. And um, if I'm elected, I'm really looking forward to serving and being back among my friends at the diocese. Thank you. Now, now Mark Garcia. <laughs> I'm a member of Church of the Advent in Baltimore, um, and uh, my, blog, my blurb talks about the experience I've had up till now volunteering in the diocese. Um, but uh, I am told that I have an analytical mind, which I always chuckle at because I was a theater major, which is not a discipline known for analytics. Um, but I do like to, uh, I, I'm a systems oriented person, I like to build, implement, and evaluate systems. And uh, my approach to uh, tackling uh, difficult situations is to uh, attempt to uh, hear all sides and uh, build a consensus that everyone in the room can support and move forward in that direction. So that's my approach. And I'm here if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you. So our last two nominees are Natalie Conway and Mark Gatz, and I do not see either of them here, but if either of you are hiding, please make yourself known. <laughs> Next, I'd like to call your attention to page 38. We will not go over these in great detail, um, but again, if you are new, 
I would happily go over these in more detail with you all at the end. I particularly, though, just want to remind you that the select rules of order, which are on 38, are the most helpful to you on the floor of convention. So I particularly want to highlight number 11, which reminds all of us of what we can do when we go to the microphone. So what we all want to avoid doing is going to the microphone and embarrassing ourselves, which is always awkward when you're in front of 380 people. So what's the first thing we want to do when we go to the microphone? And this is a trick question, and somebody didn't get it right yesterday, so they embarrassed themselves at the last pre-convention meeting. So. <laughs> <laughs> Identify yourself. And your parents. And your parents. That's wrong. <laughs> the first thing you do is wait to be recognized by the chair. I told you it was a trick question. You at home, you probably got it too. So you wait to be recognized for the chair, and then you state your name and the congregation that you serve, or whatever affiliated body you're there representing. And then you typically say, I rise, and then you fill in the blank to support to oppose, or in some other cases, to adjourn, to lay on the table, to postpone. One of the most helpful and least utilized or most underutilized ones is which one? Call the question. So if you feel, if, if the spirit's nudging you in your heart that the, that the discussion is not going anywhere new, pay attention to that spirit and march yourself up to the microphone <laughs> And do what God has called you to do. <laughs> do, not ex do not expect the Holy Spirit to be doing something else to your neighbor when the Holy Spirit might be targeting you to do that first. It's one of the dangers of being in a large gathering. We always assume someone else is going to do it for us, and maybe we're the ones that are supposed to speak up. Our youth are better at that than sometimes we are. Yes, her. Questions, God. Uh, there's a difference, at least in old Robert's Rules of Order, between calling a question and moving the question. Mm -hmm. Do we make that distinction, or is that not present? That's a good question, and our parliamentarian isn't here, and I don't know the answer. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Mary? I've only heard recently call the question, and then people get confused, because then they don't realize they have to vote on calling the question right. before they vote on the substance, so that not one person can handle it. I haven't heard move, but it's a good question. So, so for you, you're as here at home or reading from your tablets off the office or whatever. The question was, is there a difference between call the question and move the question? I'm not sure, but I think it's pretty much, for our purposes, the same thing. And if we get to that request, there is a procedural way we deal with that, which is what um, Mary was representing, that we have to vote on that before we actually vote on the resolution that we're debating. Stuart? Stuart Lucas from the Church of the Nativity. Thank you. Stuart Lucas from the Church of the Nativity. <laughs> uh, so it would be inappropriate for a troublemaker to call the question on Friday, you're telling us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 It, it wouldn't fit. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. <laughs> Just need stuff on. Now I'd like to move down to page 45, the resolutions. What I'm going to attempt to do again as a disclaimer is describe these resolutions as I understand them based on not only my own reading, but as I've interacted with some of the writers, so I can try to get a little bit more of a summary, because presumably most of you are looking at these for the first time, and so I want to make sure you have at least a little bit of the nuance and background behind them um, before you go home tonight and then try to figure out perhaps what they mean um, prior to convention. So the first one, Resolution 2015-1 on page 45, is one I've already mentioned from the clergy and lay employee compensation from the Compensation and Benefits Committee. This is almost word for word as it always is presented each year. The main thing that changes, not, not always, but the main thing are the figures, particularly the, um, the numerical figures in the chart and in the box on page 46. 
There is an error in this one that I will point out to you that was discovered at our first pre-convention meeting by the co-chair of the committee. And so if you look on page 46, at the second resolved, you will see on the third line a figure of $56,030. That is incorrect. If you want the correct figure, look down at the table below on that page under the column labeled family. In the bottom box, that first number, 57,889, is the correct number that should be in the second resolve. Now I know that's going to affect your voting, so it's important that you know that. It's the, the, the first figure in the last box. Thank you. So let's, any, uh, any of the members of the Comp and Benefits Committee who are here who would like to speak to this? Let's uh, turn to page 48 and look at the second resolution titled Amendment to Canon 1-420 of the Regents. Submitted by Dossis and Council. This is one of two resolutions submitted together as a package, so to speak. Um, they don't, they're, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. We could pass the first one without the second one, although it would be somewhat problematic. We can't really pass the second one without the first one, though. So I'll try to explain what that means. Um, there are a couple of us here, actually three of us here tonight, I think, who have served on the Dossison Regional Council Task Force the last 18 to 24 months, who have been looking at some options for the way our current regional structure is set up, which is 12 regions that was established essentially back in the 60s and then modified once significantly since then. Looking at is there a better way to do that, a simpler way to do that that allows more flexibility. So after um, two rounds of town hall meetings over the course of time and study and debate and dialogue and more debate and dialogue and looking at what other dioceses do as best practices, this is what we came up with. In a nutshell, and Susan and Mark are welcome to chime in as, as they know, what we discovered is that by and large the regional council structures are working much better outside of the Baltimore metro area than they are working inside the Baltimore metro area. So most of the regions outside of this area <coughs> are happy with the way that it is currently structured, by and large. And so we're not suggesting that those change in any significant way as far as the, the boundaries of them, the, the composition of them. What we are attempting to do is to change the five, five of the six regions represented in Baltimore metro area and combining them into, taking five of those six and combining them into two, a Baltimore North and a Baltimore South. The only Baltimore metro region that would be unaffected is the Patapsco Valley region, which is kind of Baltimore metro west and some outlying exurbs. We've checked in with as many people as we can think of, especially congregations within the Baltimore metro north and Baltimore metro south who are going to be most affected by this. Um, we're pretty <coughs> confident that, generally speaking, there's a good comfort level. I've already heard from somebody tonight who thinks that their congregation wants to Switch, switch sides, and that's fine, and there's a mechanism to do that. So we want this to be fairly fluid. One of the most important dynamics, though, in the in resolution 2015-2, due to some technical difficulties, we're only going to have audio portion for this next section, for those of you who are looking at this online. Please note that in resolution 2015-2, there are some very specific canonical changes recommended in this resolution. You can see those highlighted in the journal where there are sections that are X'd out and the intent behind that is to remove current canons that put stricter guidelines on what each region will do in the course of its work together. By removing those it actually allows more flexibility for each region to determine how often it meets, when it meets to make certain decisions so that it, it provides as much flexibility as possible. If you continue to read through some of the new suggested um, parts of that canon, it also allows at the end 
Um, the last one, subsection D, allows for the bishop to appoint a bishop's liaison for each region to provide pastoral and communication support to the region. That is not a requirement. That is simply a provision that the bishop can or can't or, or may choose not to do if he so chooses. If that were to happen, we would need to develop a job description for that. There would be some perhaps collaboration between each region in how that person would be appointed. It wouldn't, the intent would not be for the bishop to have someone that the bishop can exclusively appoint without some feedback from the region. It doesn't mean that this person has authority over the regional council president. Um, it actually could be the regional council president in addition, but it allows another layer of relationship between the bishop and the region for communication purposes and in many cases for pastoral uh, support. So if something happens in a region and the bishop cannot get there, the bishop knows who he can call to provide immediate pastoral support in that situation. It also allows, as is the case in many other or many other dioceses that have a deanery structure, for the bishop to meet regularly with these regional representatives to talk about what's going on in the region and for the bishop to be able to communicate back through these individuals um, anything that the bishop wishes to get out more um, personally. Now, if you'll next quickly look at region at resolution 2015-3, that's the second part of this restructuring, simply because we are required to list any congregations that have switched regions. And so this simply lists uh, particularly the two new regions, which are Baltimore North and Baltimore South. Most of the other regions listed are already the existing regions, and there are really only a couple of small changes, and in the cases of those congregations that are switching regions, they've already chosen to do that um, proactively as a result of how it's stated here. Now let's quickly move on to Resolution 2015-4, titled, In Support of a Moratorium on Hydraulic Fracturing in the State of Maryland until 2023. None of the submitters for this are present at tonight's meeting, but uh, you might note, if you know any of these names, that all of them live in Southern Maryland. One of the impetuses for them, as I understand it, is that there is a proposed liquid natural gas port being proposed for Calvert County, and so that would be part of the tie-in for them in this. This is obviously an issue that we've been talking about in our societal culture for a while. Uh, we are aware that since this resolution was submitted, there has been legislation in our state legislature that has been passed asking for a moratorium for the next three years, which is obviously much shorter than what this resolution proposes up until the year 2023. So just know that this has already been talked about at the state level, and we are simply adding our voice as well. Please do note, though, that this resolution would not be able to be taken forth um, until the next legislative session in 2016, since the current one has already concluded for the year. So part of the idea of doing resolutions now for the next legislative year is just the timing of our convention uh, up against the timing of our state legislation. So, for instance, you will note very specifically that um, this and the next resolution notes that this would be put forth for the next le legislative year. And that's typically done in our diocese by our advocate, Kathleen Shahinian, who is one of the submitters of this resolution. She functions not as our lobbyist, because churches can't lobby, but as our advocate. And so she would make sure this gets in the hands of the senators who are, or the legislators who are on the committees that would be putting forth um, resolutions regarding fracturing. Thank you, and now we move on to our next resolution, Resolution 2015-05, titled Death with Dignity Legislation, submitted by Sue Willis and Herb Lauder, both from Church of the Holy Comforter. They're both here, and I'm going to invite Herb to come up and speak to that, and this is where our video feed will return. Uh, <clears throat> the effort is being put forth. I served as a chaplain at Baby Medical Center for five years, and People will tell you folks don't want to die. But of course what happens is that you run into people uh, in a hospital all the time who say, why doesn't God take me? Why am I here? Why am I suffering? Why am I in pain? Uh, and one of the things that this seeks, seeks to offer, and has offered in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, is people to have the option of selecting their own death uh, and to not 
have to go through uh, the kind of pain and situations that, that we see in hospitals all the time, consuming not only people's precious time, but uh, financial uh, resources and that type of thing. For, for my own sake, uh, I'd like to see my money go to getting my grandson through college uh, than, than getting my doctor in Maserati. Uh, so uh, it gives people a choice. It does not require you to do anything. It just says, people like me, and I'm 82, so this becomes very existential, uh, would like a choice. We'd like to have an opportunity to exercise that choice like people in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont already have. Uh, as, as Scott said, the, and I had to write this before the legislature, legislature had ended, they did not get it out of the committee, uh, but I talked just uh, on Sunday with Dan Morheim, who's on that committee, uh, he's going to bring it back up again next year. There'll be some changes. So even the legislation they referred to by Google is not quite what's going to be up next year. So we're just kind of passing and thinking about the idea of letting people begin to have uh, the ability to curb their own treatment modalities and the kind of things that we do to people. Uh, let me decide what I want done to me. You do what you want. I'm not trying to say anybody else has to do what I do. But I'd like to have that privilege. Uh, and to save my family the kind of things that we see all the time of tremendously expensive uh, treatment activities that don't do anything. Uh, that people still uh, you know, are unconscious and they lie there with tubes coming in and tubes coming out uh, and they never regain enough uh, ability in life to even play cribbage. So it's a request for an alternative uh, for all of us. Uh, any other comments or questions, Scott? Thank you, Scott, and thank you all very much. Just as a suggestion, this is a particularly uh, appropriate resolution for you to look very carefully through the explanation because it gives a lot of data that, and, and I think in many cases, as we've heard, um, clears up some misperceptions about terms like death with dignity compared to terms such as lethal injection, mercy killing, or euthanasia. So it talks about some of those nuances very specifically. Yes, Stuart. Can we, can we have a discussion? Yes. Oh, well, okay. not a long discussion. Not a long. Is there is there general convention resolution stuff that's spoken to this before, or is it on the document the big blue? The, the blue book. Yeah. So the question is: Is has general convention looked at this issue before legislatively? And when we had this pre-convention meeting in Southern Maryland, um, someone pulled his smartphone out and Googled it and found that yes, in I believe 2007 was when it was discussed. I, what I can't remember is whether it passed or not. 2006? Yeah, that's right, the, the, the cycles. So it has been, it has been discussed at a, at a denominational level. Um, I think Herb's research, research revealed that um, states that have passed it have often had the, the Episcopal dioceses within those states that have already done something like this prior to it being passed, so it's, it's not unusual for us to be discussing this given what's going on in our state legislature. But this is probably a prime example of why I think a discussion on Friday rather than a debate is going to be more fruitful. If we turn to page 56 for our last resolution, resolution 2015-6 titled Building Positive Relationships Between Neighbors and Police. <laughs> Just to point out, this was submitted weeks ago. But certainly after Ferguson and Staten Island and Cleveland and some of the other things have been going on. This was also just as a point of showing how our resolution process works from previous years. Last year we passed a resolution um, giving authority to the resolutions committee to not put forth resolutions that are considered redundant. And so this year, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which put forth this resolution, also put forth a resolution asking the diocese to state that racism is a sin. And so when we looked back through our resolutions in years past, we discovered that we'd already done that back in the, I think that was 2007, maybe. So that was considered a redundant resolution, so that was not put forth. So just as an example of how, how this process works. So this is the one that did come forth, and some of the questions that have already been raised by this from pre-convention meetings prior are, are focused on what are some suggestions of what congregations can do. And so 
I've already put that back to um, Angela Shepard, the co-chair of the committee, to be thinking about that and to perhaps by the time we arrive at the convention have some, some ideas in our hands as far as it is. The one idea that was, uh, was raised by uh, St. James and Lothian, for instance, when we were down in Southern Maryland is that they offer their parking lot, which is right on Route 2, to uh, any patrol cars to sit and fill out their, their reports at the end of the day. And it also um, gives uh, them a presence on the property, which is nice, and they don't have to pay for. And they're a church that stays unlocked, and so the patrol women also know, and the patrol women also know that their restrooms are available in there, and so they take advantage of that. So it's a, it's a mutually advantageous relationship. Uh, another example is, is inviting um, law enforcement officers to come speak at your church and get to know you. Um, already here in the city of Baltimore, I know after Ferguson, um, the Baltimore City Police Department has reached out to churches, and I know a number of people, including two of the clergy at Redeemer, have participated in some, not chaplaincy training, but is that what's, it's one of them is chaplaincy. Okay, yeah, but there, there's, a, there's a nuance to that also, but uh, just the idea of making those community connections. So those are some ideas of how this might look in, your real, in, in real time in your congregation if it's passed. Any questions or comments about this? Timekeeper, how are we doing on time? General convention. This summer in early in middle of June through early July, your bishop and ten of your representatives, five clergy and five lay people, will be going to Salt Lake City for ten fun-filled days of legislation. Some of us are new. Uh, Mark and I are both new deputies. Any other deputies here? Alma, one of our seasoned deputies. We have some recovering deputies here as well. <laughs> so we just wanted to give you a chance to, and actually, um, Alma and Mark, if you would stand, and any other deputies that I'm not seeing or our first alternates. So we each diocese sends four clergy, four lay deputies that make up the House of Deputies, and the bishops meet separately kind of as the Senate, to, to use that bicameral model, and then the first alternate in each house um, gets to go as well, or in, in, in each order, so there'll be ten of us going. The three, we just all came from a Province 3 meeting where we met with the presiding bishop and the president of the House of Deputies to talk about some of the upcoming legislation that we already know about. I just want to call your attention to a couple of things that might be of interest. We're not going to show you the budget that's being proposed, because you can look that up on your, online if you find that this doesn't cure your insomnia. Um, look out online what Stuart referred to as the blue book. That, that can cover many more nights if necessary. But a couple of things that are of interest to uh, the larger population is, for one thing, we're going to be electing a new presiding bishop. And those names are due to come out this week. And so we're, I've heard some intel, I won't tell from whom because I'll get myself in trouble, uh, but someone from another diocese who uh, told me that she's pretty sure someone who used to serve in this diocese and now is the Bishop of North Carolina will be um, the, the one to beat, but at least probably a nominee. So for those of you who know Michael Curry, who used to be the rector of St. James in Lafayette Square, you heard it from me first. <laughs> but only the bishops get to vote anyway, so none of us will get to vote. We'll just get to affirm. However, that may change in years in the future because one of the... Um, Chunks of legislation we're going to be discussing is from a task force called the Task Force for, for Reimagining the Episcopal Church, which has been looking at, at our governance structure much as our task force has been looking at our regional council structure, but on a much larger scale. And so there are a number of rather significant um, suggestions, such as, for instance, switching from a bicameral process to a unicameral process, because now... There are joint committees and separate committees, so the bishops may be looking at the same legislation that the House of Deputies is, and then 
They, they vote on one piece and the House of Deputies post on another, just like in our government. We know how well that works on the federal level. And then wordsmithing has to happen, then they have to go back to their houses. And so one of the ideas is by having a unicameral house, it will make legislative work more efficient, more efficiently. But there's some kinks to be ironed out. Some, some bishops are reluctant to change, just as others are reluctant to change. So that's part of the discussion we were hearing. And there are some deputies who are reluctant to change. What? And there are some deputies who are deputies. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, for this to pass, probably it's going to be have to pass by House of Bishops and by the House of Deputies in both orders. So there's three different groups that would have to pass it. So that'll be a, a big topic of discussion. There's also going to be um, legislation about blessing of same-sex unions or marriages. And that depends on the state, obviously, in many cases. And there's been a task force that's been working on that a long time. We've had two representatives from our past delegate deputations who have been part of that process. Actually, one past member, Martha McGill, and David Mallory, who is one of our continuing deputies. And so um, they've had a hand in that process as well. The last thing, just as a smaller connection to what we've been living through in the Diocese of Maryland, is there's a new special legislative committee on addiction and recovery. Not exclusively formed as a result of what we've been going through in the diocese, but certainly heavily influenced by what we've been going through. And I am the representative from the Diocese of Maryland on that committee. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> so we've already had one, we've had one meeting online, and um, I'm proud to say that there are a lot of really smart, capable, competent, well-experienced lay professionals with a lot of uh, professional experience in behavioral um, health, and some of whom are in recovery themselves, some, of, some clergy who, are, who were in the behavioral health field prior, and or possibly are in recovery themselves in a multitude of ways, so there's a lot of layers of expertise on that committee. Likewise, in that same um, regard, our diocese, is, our diocese deputation is looking at ways to model alternates in the, evening, in, in the off times for having safer areas for people to gather socially who don't want to be around alcohol. So we are hosting on the Monday night of General Convention an alcohol-free hospitality zone that might be indoors at our hotel or it might be outside. Um, adjacent to an ice cream stand that we're negotiating with. And I'm being serious. There's a place called Scoopology in Salt Lake City, and they're working on getting a street permit so they can set up outside the convention center so that we don't have to pay $21 a head to provide something in the Hilton hospitality suite that we've been given. That's a, that's a real life, for instance. So um, we're looking at some of those options and, and ways to, again, model um, ways that we can be present without having to have it so focused on the presence of alcohol. It was one of the dynamics that I'm aware of from other people who have attended general conventions before is typically one of the few places you can hang out socially in the evenings is the hotel bars. So there are other options. So stepping off my soapbox in that regard. That concludes our business for this evening.